Today, we're going to check out five amazing gem deposits, from sites that just have ridiculous heaps of precious stones to those with unique natural wonders. And as a resident geologist here, I'm gonna tell you how they got to be that way. Let's get started. Our first destination is the legendary Land of Rubies in Upper Myanmar, once known as Burma. Burmese rubies are prized for their color and radiance, with some gems recently selling for nearly a million dollars per carat. Just to be clear, this is a carrot. Myanmar's history of gin mining goes back to at least the 13th century. At one point, an estimated 90% of the world's rubies were produced there. Kings of Burma held the title Lord of the Rubies, while the mines at Mogok were considered the world's original source of these shiny red stones. What makes this place so special? Well, first you have to understand the wild geologic conditions required to form ruby. Ruby is a form of corundum, which is only made from aluminum and oxygen, with color caused by trace elements. That beautiful ruby red requires chromium, a very rare element. But you also have to avoid iron and silica, which are pretty much in every nook and cranny of the Earth's crust. Mogok's ruby deposits lie in the Mogok metamorphic belt. This narrow, mineral-rich zone formed millions of years ago, when the Indian subcontinent crashed into Asia resulting in a geologic mess that produced the Himalayan mountains and something called regional metamorphism, which is a large-scale increase in heat and pressure that makes a rock recrystallize into a new type of rock. In this instance, limestone from the Tethys Sea was changed into marble. That marble had the building blocks for ruby, but needed a catalyst. Enter molten granite. This intruded into the marble, removing silica and iron, creating an almost perfect environment but there was still something missing. Turns out, just like my chocolate chip cookies, the secret ingredient is salt. The original limestone had salt deposits left over from its time as a seabed. That salt became a flux, allowing the aluminum, chromium, and oxygen to come together to create the beautiful rubies we know today. What's even more impressive is that the rubies of Myanmar are often found alongside a crazy array of other gems, like topaz, moonstone, and peridot that form in totally different processes. It's kind of like finding a pride of lions next to a whole pot of whales. In all, over 50 different gem species are mined in this area of Myanmar. For our next mega producer, we're taking a step back in history to a legendary location for massive diamonds, Golconda. Until the 18th century, India was the world's only known source of diamonds, and the city of Golconda was its central hub. An estimated 12 million carats of diamonds were produced by the mines surrounding the city. But the real claim to fame was the many massive, world-class stones that were found there. The Hope Diamond, the Koh Noir, the Dari Noir, the Orlov, the Regent, the Dresden Green, and many more. It was like the world's very own bonus stage. It is astronomically unlikely for even a series of mines to produce this many diamonds over 100 carats, especially with some of those coming in fancy colors like pink, blue, and green. But even crazier is that many of these diamonds are attributed to a single mine, the relatively tiny Collier Mine. With less than a half square mile footprint on the banks of the Krishna River, its diamond bearing seam was only a foot thick. So how could so many amazing specimens come from here? Turns out, Collier had a geologic trick up its sleeve. So diamonds originate from something called a kimberlite. It's like a very deeply sourced volcano shaped like a carrot. It transports diamonds from deep in the mantle and brings them up to the surface. In Southern India, there are many clusters of diamond bearing kimberlites with something very important in common. They are located near the Krishna River. It's thought that over millions of years, as the Kimberlite pipes eroded, their diamond-bearing sediments were transported downstream. Collier was situated near a meander, or bend, in the river. When water is transporting gravels, sediments, and even diamonds, it holds these objects in suspension due to the speed and strength of the flow of the water. At Collier, the water had to change direction, losing power and momentum. What was suspended was deposited in a relatively small area. This created a placer deposit, which, pun intended, means they were placed where miners later found them. 
While much of diamond formation is still shrouded in mystery, it appears that this prime location was the key for Collier to reap the benefits of Southern India's greatest diamonds for hundreds of years. Unlike Golconda's historic diamonds, our next gem locale specializes in a stone that wasn't even identified until the 18th century. I'm talking about tourmaline from the pegmatite mines of northeastern Minas Gerais, Brazil. Minas Gerais is one of the most productive gem producing complexes in the world, and the mines around the city of Araquai have provided much of the world's supply of tourmaline, a gemstone prized for its durability, as well as a kaleidoscope of dazzling colors. Over the last five years, the Cruzeiro mine alone had an average production of eight tons of tourmaline per year. What makes this area so productive? It lies in the eastern Brazilian pegmatite province. The EBPP consists of thousands of pegmatites that contain many different gemstone species. Beyond tourmaline, some of the finest aquamarine, topaz, and chrysoberyl come from here. Pegmatite isn't just a fun word for geologists to break out at parties. They're vein-like formations of igneous rocks that are created in the last stages of magma crystallization. Pockets of water and other volatile elements get concentrated as the magma cools. The superheated water provides mobility to all the essential elements, allowing them to move more quickly to places where crystals are taking shape, essentially feeding them with more of the nutrients they need to grow. This often results in very large crystals. Most of the pegmatites at Cruzeiro are zoned kind of like a bullseye. There's an inner core of quartz, a thin border zone, a wall zone made of quartz, feldspar, and muscovite, and an intermediate zone made of microcline, albite, and quartz. Throw a dart here and you'll probably hit something valuable. Typically, the tourmaline is found right along the border with the quartz core. These pegmatites have to be carefully mined by hand to avoid damaging the valuable gems inside. Our next hotspot is quite literally hot. Temperatures in Cooper Pedy, Australia can reach 120 degrees in the summer. That's why inhabitants of this opal capital of the world are often found in homes, bars, and stores dug out in holes beneath the ground. Around 95% of the world's precious opals come from Australia, and about 80% of those come from Cooper Pedy. So what makes it so special? Well, Opal is made up of silica spheres arranged in a repeating pattern. In order to get this unique kind of structure, you need water, silica, and a cycle of evaporation over a very long period of time. Cooper Pedy is located on the edge of the Great Artesian Basin, which was once a vast shallow sea covering much of Australia. The basin was covered in organic rich volcanic sediments that were exposed on the surface as the sea retreated. The groundwater turned acidic, releasing silica from the rocks and carrying it into cracks where it was trapped. As the basin came to resemble something more like the surface of Mars, the slow seasonal cycle of evaporation formed this into opal. This opal may have stayed buried deep within the earth were it not for the tectonic activity and fault lines in Cooper Pedy which pushed this volcanic sediment layer towards the surface. Still, mining here requires a good deal of luck. The opal deposits are scattered over a very large geographical area, and there are few ways to actually trace them. So mining operations are small scale using the old fashioned method of digging a hole and seeing what's in it. Now let's talk about our final gemstone hotspot, Marilani, Tanzania. This mine may not be what you're expecting, but it has earned its top five position. It is the only commercial source for one extremely beautiful and important gemstone in modern history, tanzanite. Tanzanite is a relatively new gemstone to the market, having only been discovered in the 1960s, but its rise in popularity has been so fast that it now sits as the second most popular blue gemstone after sapphire. The Marilani mining area is only about seven by two kilometers, or 4.3 by 1.2 miles, but it goes deep, as much as 800 meters. That's like three Eiffel Towers stacked. Geologically speaking, this area is kind of bonkers. The rock here is subject to a high degree of folding, which is basically where rocks actually bend over time in reaction to extreme heat and pressure. Think of rocks, the consistency of Play-Doh. Here, this folding resulted in a geological structure called boudinage, which comes from the French word for sausage and resembles linked sausages. Tanzanite is found in and around these formations. 
Oddly enough, tanzanite forms here in two different ways. One is where fluids rich with calcium and vanadium react with each other in high tension areas amidst a drop in heat and pressure. The other, interestingly, is when another gem called Savorite Garnet is destabilized by a similar drop in pressure and transforms into tanzanite. While Marilani is a relatively new kid on the block, it is already one of the world's most important mineral localities and may well one day reach the legendary status of others on our list. So what do you think of our picks? These are some of our favorites, but there are so many awesome gym locales. What would you like us to talk about next? Let us know in the comments. Like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss our upcoming episodes. Thanks for watching.